von Furstenberg. She's the founder and president of Diane von Furstenberg Studios, which is the corporate umbrella for all her diverse business, which we could go on forever and ever, which there are many. And uh, to introduce her briefly is almost impossible. She is the founder and the first to introduce Diane, uh, Diane von, no, where am I going? Diane, president of Diane von Furstenberg, uh, the corporate umbrella for all the diverse business ventures. She is referred to as a storybook princess, international designer, writer, social life. She came to the United States when she was married to Prince Egon von Furstenberg with uh, two lovely children, Tatiana and Alexander. Diane was born in Brussels, Belgium, educated in Switzerland at the University of Switzerland. Economics was her major, imagine. She also went to school earlier in England and Spain, becoming truly a citizen of the world. Um, her famous print wrap dress started in 72 and became her signature. She has created a fragrance named Tatiana after her daughter. Her name is licensed uh, from eyewear to luggage to everything. The Wall Street Journal, Newsweek wrote about her uh, five million. No, no, you have to because I'm just touching the silly parts. You'll do the fun parts. And uh, anyway, I think I will cut this short because I'm wasting time with you, for you to spend with Ms. Furstenberg. She has written many books too, and currently uh, last, I think it's six years now, you're married to Barry, right? Four years, Four years. oh, okay. But anyway, uh, Q, she'll tell you about QVC and uh, her life, and, uh, and she turned, uh, that's it, turning a passion for life into a penchant for business, and I would love to welcome Ms. Furstenberg. They all love you. I didn't have to say a word. No, no. Thank you very much. Every year I come here. And ooh, that's a big crowd today we have. All right, so um, I'm, what I'm going to do today is I'm going to tell you about my own experience because I think it's always the best thing. And I'm going to take you through the through the, my business memoir, so to speak, and tell you the ups and the downs, and, and after that we can take some questions. So uh, in order for me to continue to speak free instead of reading something, I will follow pictures, and that gives me, that gives me, that would be nice if I found a picture. All right, I'm going to try this way. Uh, sorry. I don't know what happened here. Oh, and uh, where slide here? Here, you do it. Okay. Where's our guy? Huh? All right. Okay. Now, all you have to do. Okay. There. Perfect. All right, this is me as a little girl in Belgium and uh, with my father and my mother. And uh, I, was, I was born in Belgium where I had a perfectly normal childhood in a country that was raining all the time and quite boring. And uh, everyone in Belgium had blonde straight hair and I had little black curly hair. So I felt very different and I very much wanted to run away and go away and start my own life somehow. And uh, I, uh, when I, usually I say that most fairy tale, when you read a fairy tale, it always ends up with a girl marrying the prince. Well, in this case, that's when my fairy tale actually started. I married this very handsome, good looking, well, handsome, good looking, uh, uh, um, Egon Furstenberg. He was a prince and he was handsome and we had met at university and uh, I married him at the age of 22. Now, when I married him, right there on this photograph, I was actually already pregnant and, uh, and uh, it's, 
I had, we went to university, he came to America, and I went to a friend of mine in Italy who had a factory. He actually had three factories. He had a printing factory, printing plant. He had a knitting factory, a knitting mill, and he had a factory where he actually made uh, loungewear. And he, he is actually the man, you see the tall man in the back, his name was Angelo Ferretti. He was an Italian, flamboyant, Italian industrialist. And uh, I spent almost, well, I, actually I spent about a year watching him screaming at everybody. And I, it was, I was doing some kind of an internship. I thought I was really doing nothing. But it turns out that now when I look back, I learned so much during that year. I learned everything about printing, I learned everything about knitting and jersey, and then when he bought the other factory, I learned about you know making clothes actually. I did not go to a fashion school, I went to a school of economics. Uh, I did not know at the time I was gonna go to fashion, I didn't think I was that interested in fashion, and it, it just happened, it's a, a, an amount of circumstances that led me to that man, he had these factories, he liked me, I, you know, I interned in his factories, then my, my boyfriend, Aegon, came from America, he came to Rome, we met in Rome, we got engaged in Rome, I got him pregnant in Rome, and, uh, and then when he, then he had left, and I found myself pregnant, so I had to rush and get married faster than I expected, and I, w I felt very, you know, that kind of motivated me that I really, really wanted to be independent, and I, I was quite upset about having to marry so fast like that, and um, so I, I convinced my friend, Angelo Ferretti, I said, you know, what I would like to do is I would like to make some samples and since I am going to live in America, maybe I can work, I can sell these clothes in America for you. And that's what I did. I took, um, <clears throat> I, I came by boat because I wanted to come by boat because it came, the boat goes slower and I wanted to think very slowly of my life ahead and I had you know, a little tummy, and I had a big, uh, big suitcases with all my things, and amongst my things, I had my first samples. I had about, I don't know, about a hundred samples, or I don't know how many, and they really weren't very, you know, they were just like little t-shirts, and little t-shirt dresses, and little polo shirts, and polo dresses, and I came to America, and I went, oh, no, all right. And I went to meet Diana Vreeland. So Diana Vreeland was at the time, we are now 1970, uh, Diana Vreeland was editor-in-chief of Vogue magazine. She was a very intimidating, very powerful woman. And she, but she also was very, well, she was known for helping young people, young talent and everything. So I managed to have an appointment with her and I got into her office at Vogue magazine. I was trembling with my big suitcase, and everyone was so beautiful, and all these clothes and jewelry, and, and everything was red or black, and, and I was really intimidated. And all of a sudden, a woman comes in, and she looks at me, and she said, chin up, up, up. And I said, oh my god, this is not starting well. And, uh, but I did show her my clothes, and she did like them. She said, oh, great, wonderful, da, da, da. And there were two models there, and she she, she had them try certain things and move certain things and pull some uh, shoes and everything. And the whole thing went so fast. I was completely, you know, I, I, I didn't understand what was happening. And all of a sudden, I found myself on the floor outside her office, packing up in my suitcase with her assistant looking at me and saying, I think we're going to help you. And I said, great, but what do I do now? And she said, well, what you really have to do is you have to show it to buyers. And I say, how do I do that? And she said, well, let's see. She said, it's soon market week. And if you took a hotel, uh, a hotel room in uh, the Gotham Hotel, which is now the Peninsula Hotel on 55th Street, that's where the California market shows their they're closed, so you know that there will be traffic. So if you get a room there, you could do that. And I said, and how will people know about me? And she says, well, you can list yourself in something called a fashion calendar. 
And I said, okay, can I use your phone? And she said, yes. And I sat at her desk and I called the fashion calendar and I called the Gotham Hotel and I enlisted myself to show at Fashion Week. And, uh, and indeed, Vogue helped me. And uh, two of my dresses were in, in Vogue that month, in September, one on Marisa Berenson, one on Pat Cleveland. And if you see the prices, you could see that that's long, long, long time ago. <laughs> And uh, anyway, I had a very, very busy two, year between, two years between 1970 and 1972 because not only did I get married and decorate my new apartment, but I also had two, not one child, but two children. And as a matter of fact, on this photograph, my husband, me, my son, and my daughter, all the four of us together, we are 50 years old. So it is now, it's 1972, and <clears throat> for two years, I kind of showed the clothes, took some orders, but I worked in a very, very amateurish way. I, what I did is that I showed the clothes in the hotel, I took some orders, back and forth to the factory, begging my manufacturer to please make me these very tiny, tiny, quantities that were barely sample orders. And I said, please, please. He said, but I am a factory. I cannot do these small quantities. I said, please, 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 stay with me. I know I have something. So he did stay with me and, and allowed me to make that. And then I would come back and, and um, invoice and pack and ship and go to, I mean, I just do a one person operation out of my apartment with my two babies for two years. But then I knew after, after two years, I really realized that I actually had something that my, I, I, I actually thought that I had a product, that my little clothes, which were barely clothes really, but I, I, those few samples I had and I had sold, there was something good. There was something different than everything that was around and there was something right. So I thought, the best thing for me to do, and the easiest thing for me to do, would be to become a division in one of the large Seventh Avenue firm. So I called my lawyer and I asked him, I said, can you please give me the names of some large companies and people that I could go and see? So he did, he gave me three big companies and I had the name of the, of the, of the, the people, and I went to see them, you know, again with my suitcase, my little things, da 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 da, and I would show them the clothes, and they would look at me. I was very young and kind of cute, and they would look at me like I was this strange animal, and uh, and I say, yeah, yeah, it's nice, but you know, that's not for us. We we deal in big volume, and these are really boutique clothes, so I don't think so. One of them, Mr. Actually, it's very funny because what, what aren't we? What, what's the name of this? Isn't this the Pomeranz? Yes, Pomeranz. This, th this hall? Okay, well this man who actually has his name on this hall, John Pomeranz, was the one person who was actually very nice to me. What he did is he, he saw me and he looked at me and he was very amused and he was, and he said, you know what, you don't need me. You could do it on your own. All you have to do is get a showroom and a salesperson, a salesman. I said, oh, I'm too afraid to get a showroom. I don't know anything. I'm, you know, I've just been two years in America. I, I don't know how to do it. He said, all you need really is a, is a salesman. So he, he said, call me back in a few days. So I called him back in a few days. He made me come back again. And he introduced me to a man uh, who was a salesman. He was, to me, he, he seemed like he was so old. He was 39 years old. And, uh, and he had, you know, been in sales before, and he talked to me, and he, he looked at me, and he wasn't working anyway, and he said, well, I said, but you know, I can't really pay you. He said, I, this is what I, I offer you. He said, if you pay me $300 a week, and you give me 25% of the company, I'll do it with you. So I thought, okay. 25% of nothing is nothing, so it was easy to do. And, uh, and uh, he became my partner. And for $1,000, bought a quarter of the, 25% uh, tw uh, of the company, and we started. And I showed him the clothes, and I could tell that he wasn't really getting it. He wasn't really understanding it. So I called the factory, and I asked the factory to make 
uh, a few men's shirt in that fabric, which was the jersey. And I did, and I gave it to him. And after he wore the, 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 the shirts, he kind of understood what, what, what it was all about. And, um, and so we took a showroom at 537th Avenue, and he knew, he had a lot of people that he knew, all the stores he knew, and we were in business. And this is me in the showroom, and actually, if you look at it, it could be today or any time. And uh, I needed to announce to the trade that I was in business, so I took an ad in women's wear, and I couldn't afford the model, so I sat myself on a white cube, and then I wrote in the white cube, feel like a woman, wear a dress, and I signed my name, and little did I know that, you know, this dress, this line, you know, this phrase and everything, and that name actually would become a brand. Uh, very soon after that, I, uh, my, two, my leopard and snake, my snake print was on the cover of Women's Wear Daily, and immediately after, lots of celebrities of the, at the time were wearing the clothes. And if you see on the, on the, on the top, on the right, is uh, Julie Eisenhower. She is um, um, the President Nixon's daughter. And she wore that little wrap top with a, little, with a skirt that was on the, at the time it was Lord and Taylor a catalog. And she wore it. And it was very popular, that little wrap top. So I thought to myself, hmm, maybe I should turn that little wrap top into a dress, which is what I did. And that was the wrap dress. And um, it just happened like that. In the corner of the factory, out of a little top, I made a dress. And it became, it became not only a very, very successful dress, but it became almost like a social phenomena. Every woman was wearing that dress. And we would make that dress in so many ways. And I, it made me land on the front page of the Wall Street Journal. And, uh, and that was only, that was, what does the date say, 76? January 76? Yeah. So it's only, I mean, if you think that in 1972 I really started, in 1974 the dress was born, the, the wrap dress, only two years later it had become such a quick but huge success that I was on the cover, on the front page of the Wall Street Journal, which was a big deal. And I have a very funny anecdote, which I will tell you about that day. I, the, as you know, I had small children, and I, uh, at that point, I was already separated from my husband, and so I had two, I was a working mother with small children on my own, which means that I tried to stay as much as possible at night with them. Now, my partner would make me travel a lot, go to Pittsburgh and go to Omaha and go to where, Florida and Cleveland, and he would make me go to the, all these, these specialty stores and all these department stores, and I would have personal appearances, where, by the way, is where I learned so much again. And so it was one of those early morning, because I would try to stay with my children at night, and so and take early flight in the morning. And so I am going to Pittsburgh or Cleveland or somewhere like some fun place like that in the morning. And uh, I'm going, I'm, I'm in the airport and that's the day I'm on the Wall Street Journal front page. So I like usually when you go to play, to, to the plane, you buy a lot of new, you know, magazines. And on top of it, I have the Wall Street Journal. And so I'm sitting in the plane I'm the only woman, we are now in 1976, the only woman in the plane, and I'm young, and I, you know, and I have long legs, and whatever, <laughs> and, uh, and so there's a man next to me, and he's, you know, looking at me, and looking at me, and he's trying to think, well, how am I going to get in the conversation, and then he looks at the paper, the Wall Street Journal, and he says to me, why does a girl, pretty girl like you, read the Wall Street Journal for? So I looked at him and I thought, jerk. <laughs> but I didn't say anything. I didn't say anything. I just smiled and I talked to him. I never told him, here I am, you know, if you read that I, this is me. I didn't say anything. And of all the satisfaction I've ever had in my life, that's probably one of the very best satisfaction, never having told him anything. Of course, every time I make a speech, I tell the story. So. <laughs> 
Anyway, uh, so I had become very, very, very quickly uh, very successful, and I was really, you know, I was barely, I was uh, 28 years old, very inexperienced, and, you know, th things were happening so fast. And because my name had become, well, at the time I didn't know what a brand was, but it had become so successful, there were a lot of different manufacturers that wanted, that came to me and asked if they could have my name for different products like eyewear and, and scarves and, and different things. And so this, before I knew, I, you know, before I knew, I turned around, I made lots of these deals. Most of them were not good idea, but anyway. And uh, I had become a brand. And that same year, I was on the cover of Newsweek. Well, if you think that Wall Street Journal is something, Newsweek at the time was, was a huge, huge thing. And it was also an election year. And, year that, you know, uh, media was really very important. So whatever, I am on the cover of Wall Street Journal and, and every single store that has four walls and a ceiling wants more dresses and more wrap dresses and more dresses. And my salesman, Dick, wants to sell more dresses and more dresses. And my manufacturer, my Italian manufacturer, wants to make more and make more. And everybody thinks that is, this is never going to stop. And I'm trying to diversify, and my partner doesn't want me to diversify. He wants to make more wrap dresses and, and more of the same kind. And so this is a good picture <laughs> to illustrate that all of a sudden, you know, what happens is very often you will hear that, that when you on the cover, when you get so much exposure, like a cover of a big magazine like that, could be the kiss of death. And indeed it was, because you know, I was so, I mean, we keep on pumping more and more and more that the product got saturated. Every woman in America had two, three, four, five, sometimes 20. But at some point, you know, there was the, so one day, I remember terrible Monday, oh, every Sunday page, every page in the Sunday New York Times was a markdown uh, uh, of those dresses. and. So anyway, it was, it was very difficult. Here I am, not yet 30 years old, and all of a sudden I have $4 million worth of dead inventory. And uh, so that was my first big disaster. Um, but, you know, when things are, some things are good, some things are good. The fact that by now, even though, you know, I have all this inventory and people are complaining and everything, on the other side, my name has become really, really, really hot, and the big manufacturers now are interested. They realize that the name and the product is a valid thing. So I managed to find a big uh, company on 7th Avenue called, at the time it was called Puritan Fashion, and the man who was running it, was, his name was Carl Rosen, and he had, two, and he had also, Cal, he had just started Calvin Klein Jeans. So he had Calvin Klein jeans, and now he took over Diane von Furstenberg's dresses. So I, I was very happy to unload him my inventory, and uh, my only responsibility at this point was to continue to design, but I would have no operation um, um, responsibilities at all. I parted with my partner, I gave him you know, he came in with a thousand dollars. He left with a million dollars in four years, so that was fine. And uh, and I decided that I was going to go into the beauty business. And uh, because all around, you know, all these years I had gone all around the country doing personal appearances, and I had really established a wonderful relationship with consumer, and I had learned so much about women as I was becoming a woman myself, as I was creating products for women, and as, I mean, it, there was something really wonderful. So I was very intrigued by cosmetics, and, uh, and I started to research and do a lot of research on the cosmetic world. And I also decided to write a book about, and I wrote a book of beauty. Of course, at 28, 
no matter what, you're beautiful, so that was a little stupid. But anyway, but it, it taught me a lot of things. I learned a lot of things, and when the book came out is when I uh, launched my fragrance that I named after my daughter, Tatiana, and then I had a cosmetic line called The Color Authority. And then once again, I was on the road, and this time I was doing makeup. And once again, I was very, you know, quite successful, it was very fun. Me and my makeup artist, we used to go and travel the country. We thought we were rock stars, we would unpack and people were waiting for us in line and we would do their makeup. And it was really, really quite fun. And we had the best colors. At the time, makeup was quite bold and, and we had the most wonderful, wonderful colors and we had the best fun doing it. And. Um, so we did that, I did that for about five years and the company became quite large. But once again, I had, um, I was doing the designing, I was doing the marketing, I was doing the, promote, the promoting, but I wasn't really doing the, the, the business side. And uh, one day as I was in Paris, my pres the president of my company called me and said to me, well, I think that you're going to have to come back because the bank doesn't want to give us any more money, so we need your personal signature. And I said, wow, what do you mean my personal signature? And he said, yes. And so I hadn't realized that we had actually, in order to grow so fast, we had actually borrowed $10 million. So I was brought to reality and I did not want to give my personal guarantee because I had, you know, I was so proud that I had been able to buy a beautiful apartment on Fifth Avenue for my children and a house in the country. And so I didn't really want to do that. So I met with the bankers, but there was no way they were going to give me any more money. And I said, well, what do you want me to do? Would you like me to sell my company? I've had a lot of people interested. And the banker said, Sure, if you can. And he was very arrogant and very annoying. And I said, of course I can. And I did. I sold my company for uh, a, long, a lot of money to a, an English pharmaceutical company, Beecham, who was interested in developing a whole cosmetic side. And uh, I did that. And so uh, that by doing that, I really was... I no longer had any operation of any company. Everything I had was a license. And even though I was considered number one, no, number seven in women's owning business, I really had no control over my business at all, except barely creative. I had uh, many licenses. I had luggage. I had jeans. Don't ask me how I got there. And. Um, and, but I really had nothing that I could control on my own. We are now 1983, and fashion now is gone. It's the time of dynasty. You know what dynasty is? You're probably too young. Anyway, it's dynasty, and uh, what's the other one? Dallas. And, you know, and everything is very rich and Reagan and all of that. And so, uh, I, um, so I thought maybe I should have a couture line. So what I did is I created a couture line which I had in a small uh, a shop on, at the Sherry Netherlands Hotel on Fifth Avenue. And, uh, and I did that because I thought if I do that, that's the only thing I can control since everything is licensed. But to tell you the truth, this wasn't really something that w represented very much my spirit and what I like. So I was not so into it. And beside that, I fell in love with a writer in Paris. And, uh, and beside that, my children are now teenagers. And uh, you always love your children, but when they're teenagers, you don't like them. And they don't like you either. And so my children went to boarding school, and I moved to Paris. And, uh, and I moved to Paris, and I was in Paris, full, and there I fulfilled another, another fantasy of mine, which was I always, because when I grew up, I loved books so much, and I always wanted to do something with books, and I remember when I was about 10 years old, and I said, what could I do that I love books so much? And my mother said, well, you could become a librarian. And the librarian in my school 
had big glasses and bad breath and, and I didn't want to become her, so I didn't become a librarian. But somewhere in the deep side of my heart, there was always this love for books. So since I was living in Paris and living with a writer, I started a small publishing house in France, because after all, French is my language. And I had a little bit of a literary salon, and I met a lot of writers, and, and it was quite, quite nice. And, and while I was doing that, you know, I, in order to keep a little bit in touch with my past life and with my licensees, I did, I did some books on beds and the bath, some inspirational kind of decorating um, coffee table books. And uh, I did that for about five years, and I would every now and then I would come back to America and try to see what the licensees were doing, and they weren't really listening to me, so I would go back to Paris and collect my royalties and not think about it. But then five years later, my children have now grown into beautiful, grown beautiful young people who are now in college, they both went to Brown, and they start to start their life on their, you know, their own life, and they have ideas, and they want to do things, and I'm just listening to them, and I realize that, you know, when I was young, I had a, I had a little empire, and my little empire was no longer there, so, and also, by the way, the French love affair was towards the end, so I decided to come back. <laughs> and, uh, <coughs> So I, I come back to America, I missed my children, and I missed my house, and I m and also miss my work, and I miss my brand, because I, I, always, I always joke that I had, when in my very, very, before I was 24, I had three children, a son, a daughter, and a brand. And the son was looking great, the daughter was looking great, and the brand was not looking good at all. It had completely collapsed, and, and every, every company had done different things, and it had lost its spirit, and it had lost everything. And so I came back, and it was, that's when I had the hardest time of my entire career was then. It was worse than the $4 million in that inventory. It was worse than anything. I would go and see the, the, the companies that had my names and try to motivate them and show them and give them advice and give them, tell them what to do. And they would just look at me like I was this has been and not paying any attention to what I was saying. And I would try to meet stores. And, and it, it was, I ate more humble pie than in, during those, those years. Then it was, it was really, really difficult. But I knew that somehow I had had such a great relation with, um, with uh, my consumers. I had had such an important relationship with my consumers. I knew that if I could reach them directly, they would remember. And, but I didn't know how to do that. I thought maybe I would do, you know, a catalog. It was very difficult. So one day, out of the blue, somebody mentioned uh, um, somebody, a very smart marketing person, uh, Joe Spellman, invited me. He said to me, I, I actually know. It's very important, I'm giving you, you're all starting your life, so it's very important. The biggest advice I can give you all is to pay attention. Pay attention to detail, pay attention to what people say, pay attention to whatever, because sometimes somebody will say something, and that's the one thing that you need to go to the next step. I was at the airport uh, going to Paris, and this man, Joe Spellman, who was head of marketing at the time for Elizabeth Arden, comes to me and he said, you know, Diane, you could be the biggest brand in the 90s. We were not, now it was like early 90s. It was 91 or 9. And uh, it was so nice. I mean, nobody had said something so nice to me. Everybody had looked at me and said, oh, you were lucky once. Forget it, you know? So I was really so touched. So I, you know, I, I obviously I continued to talk to him, and we had lunch, and I, you know, I wanted to know more. How could I do it again? And, uh, and he took me uh, with Marvin Traub, who used to be the chairman of Bloomingdale's, who no longer was the chairman of Bloomingdale's, who had started a consulting company. And the three of us, one Saturday afternoon on February 2nd, <coughs> 
no, yeah, what, in Feb February 29, 1992, we went, we took the Metro Liner and we went to Philadelphia. And we went to visit a company called QVC, which was selling on television. And I always remember, we walked in there and it was l a little bit like a theater and there was, on the middle, it was a Susan Lucci. Uh, she is a soap opera. And Susan Lucci was selling shampoos. And half an hour that I watched her, she, she sold about $600,000 worth of shampoo. I thought, oh, this is great. I could do this. This is a personal appearance on a, personal le on a national level. So I was very intrigued, and I really thought it would be great to, to, to do cosmetics like that. But they weren't interested in me doing cosmetics. They really wanted me to do clothes. And I said, well, how can I sell clothes on television? It didn't seem to be possible. And also, I didn't want to tell them that, but the, everything they sold there was quite tacky. But anyway, I didn't have any choice, and so I thought, okay, let me think about it. And I remember I went to Hong Kong, and I went to visit a, a manufacturer that I had done business with. And at the time, years ago, I was a big company, and he was a very small factory. And by then, years have gone by, and he has a big factory, and I'm just a very nobody person. So. I go to him and I say, I have this concept of creating some silk items on television, scarves and, and shirts and, and uh, you know, solids and prints and, you know, could you help me to manufacture this? And he said, sure. He was intrigued by the idea. So we worked on this concept called silk assets that I sold on television on QVC and, well, in one, the first two hours, we sold $1,300,000 worth of silk assets. So it was all of a sudden, the same people who looked at me like a has-been who was never going to do anything, all of a sudden turned around and called me a pioneer. And what this really did is that other than the fact that, yes, I, it became very successful and I, I did very well at it, but it gave me confidence, and it gave me confidence, and that was the most important thing. I knew that that wasn't really the customer. I, 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 I really wanted to go back to, to the business that I had once that was um, catering to the woman who is very active and, and you know, that had this, the spirit that I had wanted to have. And of course, on television, it wasn't exactly that woman. But anyway, I was encouraged. It gave me confidence. And I thought, the best thing I could do is if I would become a designer, because I, you have to understand, twice I had to sell my company because I had too much inventory. So I had some kind of a little inventory phobia. So I didn't really want to start again and have to buy goods and keep them in the warehouse. I, I was looking for shortcuts that would allow me not to have inventory, which, by the way, with the television, I did that because I would do the designing. I would make sure that they get it on time, but I would, they would go directly from the manufacturer to, the tele, to, the, to their warehouse. So I, 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 at the time, all the departments, I know I'm giving you a lot of information here, but it's all valuable information. And, and I'm trying to make it as little as I can. Uh, at the time, oh, uh, there were a lot of mergers and acquisition in all the department stores. To give you an idea, when I first started in the 70s, there were 2,000 stores. By now, there are five. They have all merged and merged and merged. As they were merging, a pr the president of Federated was somebody that I had done business with. So we go to breakfast, and I said to him, his name was Alan Questrom, I said, Alan, why don't, I would like very much to go back in business, in the fashion and in beauty. Why don't I become a brand for, I give you an exclusive for all your stores, and I become your private brand? He thinks it's a great idea. Um, and uh, and we enter into an agreement. Now oh, here it's not going to work. Well, okay. And I and I realized that for them it was a big financial commitment. So I said to them, "This is what I will do for you. I will have a design studio, and I 
I found this great place downtown in the mid back district. I will have a design studio with showrooms and designer. We will design for you. And, uh, and also the other thing I will do is I will write a book to tell the story, to make a line between the past and the future. So by the time we, we start this line, I will launch the book, people will know, and it will be the beginning of something. Well, guess what? Everything was right. We started to talk to lawyers and this and that. One Friday afternoon, just, you know, we were going to start designing. Actually, I had started designing, and we were going to start. So one Friday afternoon, as I go to the country, I get a phone call, and they say, the deal is not happening. So here I was. I had, I, was, I had already started to write a book, and I had already signed a deal with a publisher and with a woman to work with me on the book. I had already bought the house downtown to make my design studio, but there was no deal. So I was quite upset. It was Friday, and um, I mean, I was very upset. Anyway, by Sunday, Sunday afternoon, I somehow found strength to myself. And what had happened that I had did, forgot to tell you is that I had noticed and I had been told by a lot of people, by my daughter, by my daughter-in-law, that young girls were buying the old dresses in vintage shops. And in Japan and everywhere, it was like, you know, this silent thing that was happening. So by the time Sunday came, came back, I had decided that I was going to start again, and I was going to start with the original dress, the wrap dress, which people, young people, were now buying in vintage shops. And now we go front. And indeed, you know, th so this is when the launch, when my, my daughter-in-law, we launched the, um, the wrap dress, and all this young, new generation were buying the dress. Again, and now we are in 1998. And it was, oh, this is funny. I, 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 for the launch, I did an exclusive launch with Saks. And for the launch, and this is, again, it, it didn't happen this way. I had shot a whole bunch of colored pictures, which I thought were beautiful. And when I showed it to Saks, they didn't like it. And the president said, but I like the black and white one. She's laughing. So I looked at these two pictures all night, and I didn't know, what, I, what am I going to do with them? And then I made them speak. And the, uh, the picture on the left says, he stared at me all night. Then he said, something of you reminds me of my mother. And people said, no, you can't say that. Nobody wants to look like their mother. And, but I just thought it was fun, and I didn't think much about it. And that's the campaign that I launched. But little did I know that actually that is what, what happened. And at the beginning, it wasn't really the woman at Saks who was an older woman, who was a woman my age, actually. She wasn't buying the dresses because she had already worn them, and she didn't quite look as good as she used to. But it was a whole new generation. I mean, I also had the dresses in, in this shop called Scoop that was in West Broadway, that at the time, everything in that shop was black. And the young girls were wear, would wear them with combat boots. And that's when I realized that I had something completely new again, and that I had a new brand. So I, start, I did a new logo. I hired a new creative director an Englishman called uh, Nathan Jenden, who took the wrap dress and updated it and did so certain things that I would never do, like putting my face on t-shirts or on taxi cabs. And I opened my first shop in the West Village on West 12th Street, where everybody said, who on earth was going to come to 12th Street? And yet, you know, the neighborhood became a very hot neighborhood. Then we opened a shop in Miami, in London, two years ago, I think. Last year, we opened in Paris, and Madonna came for the opening, which is the reason why we had all these paparazzi. A month ago, we opened Los Angeles, and this is the fall line that you will actually, no, you won't see. This is the line that's in the store now called w Winter Palace. 
This is the spring line that um, I showed um, two months ago that was called Dolce Diva. We also open a shop on the internet, dvf.com. I started in cosmetics again, launched a, a, a line of fine jewelry for H. Stern, which is something I have wanted to do for 20 years, swimwear, and we have a whole new generation of celebrities wearing the clothes. And as you can see, both Madonna and Renee Zwelliger are wearing the same dress on a publicity tour. And this year, I was very honored to receive the CFDA Lifetime Award, which is what you get when you get old. <laughs> and I just came back from Hong Kong, where I opened my first shop. And that's about it. So this is where I am today, and uh, I'm happy to help you with any question. <laughs> any question? Yes. One piece of information that I wish I had known. It's funny because the second time around, my second career is actually is, is, is almost more fun because you have experience. But I basically do the same thing that I did instinctively. I think the most important thing is to do things with passion, to make sure that you make sense and to pay attention. Pay attention to your consumer. Pay attention who is wearing the clothes and why and how and, and be very hands-on. That would be my best advice. Any other question? Nothing? Yes? Yes, uh, uh, Barry is my husband only for four years, but I have known him for 30 years. And he, he was smart then, and he's still smart now. And yes, he has been very helpful, and uh, as I have been to him, I think. Yes, of course. And I think to exchange, that's the thing, you know, the advantage of, of getting old and experience and all of that is that you have um, met people and known people and helped people and they help you and and I think it's like layers and layers and layers of 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 understanding things and helping things and seeing things and and that's what makes experience so I think yes it's very important to and the, you, you, your friends that you met at college and your teacher that you have met at college and and the people who spoke to you at college and all of that can click something in your mind and you could and you have these wonderful things about going on internship where you can actually enter a company and because you are not paid they they don't you know they let you see everything and that's where you learn and that's where you know and that's what I mean it's in you know studying is one Wonderful, and, and, and this school is amazing. And but working in the trenches also is is it's just a wonderful, wonderful thing. And and what you just have to do is that you just have to go and get wet because unless you get wet, you can't learn how to swim. Yes. Yes, you. How was I able to meet Diana Vreeland? Well, you know, I had married a prince, so <laughs> that helped. Uh, you know, you 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 gotta you know you gotta use whatever you can use. You know, I mean, you know, uh, whatever. I mean, you know, you gotta somehow get there. And that's wonderful thing about what I, I mean. I came from Europe, and that's one of the wonderful thing about this country is that everything is possible, and you can meet people, and you can you know, and you just have to work your way in and, and, and some people have it more easy and some people have it less easy but n nobody has I mean there are no shortcuts for anybody and if you have a shortcut you pay at the exit so it's the same yes no you can't copyright a dress I mean my dress was copied more than anything I mean you just have to go with it you know um, but I did, my, my advantage is that I immediately had a, a, a manufacturer 
you know, so I didn't have to look for that. I started with a manufacturer, so because I started with a manufacturer, I already had a finished product, which I can make in that factory. And also what was very helpful to me is that in a certain way, he financed me, because I would get paid and then I would pay him, you know. So even though he didn't lay out money, he was giving me products, you know, with nice, um, nice, um, how do you call it? Nice terms, so that's how it works, yes? Oh, I get inspiration from everything. I have my camera always with me, and I'm a big hiker, and I always have my camera, and I could photograph a piece of bark or leaf or whatever, and, and then I go in the computer and it becomes a print. Everything is, is an inspiration to me, but most of my inspiration really come either from nature or girls in the street, or girls like you. Yes? Mm -hmm. The blonde first. Well, the most rewarding thing is to have an idea and, and to see it happen, and then to see lots of women wearing your clothes and coming to you. And, and it happened to me twice, in two, two generations, you know, coming to me, oh, I wore that dress and I met my boyfriend, or I wear that, da, 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 da. I mean, that's, you know, satisfaction. The, the sociological aspect of fashion is so interesting and so, so rewarding, because you do things and then they become part of life, and, and women, um, get empowered and you know and when big movie stars decide that they're going to wear a wrap dress when they go on their publicity tour because that's the easiest thing and it, it's, it's just so flattering. So I think that's the most rewarding thing is to have a dream and make it happen. Yes? What? My creativity, well, it's, you know, I, I, at this point, what I wanted very much is, I, I'm so lucky to have been able to regain my brand and to start again a few years ago. And even though I'm a grandmother, I'm considered a young brand. And so the, and it's a brand that has a very special DNA and a very strong DNA. And what I want to do now is I want to, and I also have a wonderful distribution globally, but in the very best stores. And, but I'm at a good price in the best store, so I, I think that I'm a very nice place. So what I want to do is expand in accessories, expand in, you know, more into the brand, but, but very much focus to this woman who, who is this woman in the driving seat. And this woman is the woman that I wanted to become, and it's the woman that I used to be, and, and that's, ex do you want me to shut up? Is that why the line? <laughs> All right, any more? Y yes? My aim in the beginning was to be independent. It's the independence was the, the, fu the fuel. Yes? No, we have, I have a creative director and we have, oh, in the design department, we have about eight people full time and then we have a lot of interns. And uh, so it's a lot of, you know, we, we design, one collection per month, so we we do a lot of a lot of product. But I am very very involved myself too. Very. Yes. I love illustration. I do. I've always loved illustration. I I I don't know why. Uh, I I think illustration can be very very strong. It can be as strong as a photograph. Illustration is. And it's, you don't see enough good illustrators, and I'd love to see your book. <laughs> yes? No, I try not to do, I call them partnership if I do things, and I'm very, very careful because you always lose control with licensing, so it's a very slippery road. Yes? Yes, I, I actually, I do have a license for luggage. That's the only one that has not stopped all along. Yes. Yes? I found my manufacturer, it was a friend. 
It's I found the manufacturer before I found the job. I mean, b before I found the vocation. So it's because I found the manufacturer that I got into fashion. So, you know, in life, it's either you have a vocation from the very beginning, or else it's life that takes you somewhere, and that happened to be my road. Yes, over there. No, I, we design most of the prints we design ourselves. I have a huge archive, but I always look at everything and everybody, and uh, it's, you can contact us. Yes? If I went back in time, would I go to fashion school? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, that would have been helpful. Yes? Who? No, they're very good friends. Yes? Anybody else? Yes? Well, that's a good question. My, uh, the beauty line is, uh, it's always about colors. And, uh, um, I'm kind of working at it right now. I mean, I, I have it, but it's still only in my stores, and I'm working. In, yeah. And my stores, that's it. Yeah. Questions? That's okay. All right, thank you very much. <laughs>